Hi everyone, welcome, welcome to the last reading of Mary Ruthel's tenure as our writer of Trias Writer in Residence. This year I'm Catherine Holt, I'm the director of Trias, and the opening act to the opening act here to introduce the person who's going to introduce our reader. Uh, so I also have to knock off some logistical work and announcements. So here's the first one. We have one last creative writing reading this year, part of the Writer's Reading series with fiction writer Rachel Marston and poet Timothy O'Keefe. They're going to read on April 25th. It will be awesome. You should go. And that will be, I think, in here, um, as usual. Because this is the last trees reading of the year, there are a lot of people to thank, so bear with me. First and foremost, I have to thank Sue Gage, without whom I am curious. <laughs> to make sure these readings and all their attendant events and travels and meals and posters and emails and such go smoothly. She remembers when I forget. She thinks of things I never would. She is, in short, necessary completely and thoroughly, in addition to being much beloved. Thank you, Sue. I want to thank Brian from the bookstore, who supports Trius so regularly by setting up book tables at many of our readings. Books make wonderful gifts for birthdays, etc. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank the good folks at Buildings and Grounds, who always do a smashing good job with our setup and the strange things that we sometimes ask them for. And they don't even tease us about those strange things nearly as much as they could. And the members of IT, who also do a smashing good job with our setup and strange requests and tease us possibly even less than people. Uh, I want to thank the offices and departments on campus that have supported our reading series this year and in the past, especially the Provost Office, Art and Architecture, Asian Studies, Spanish and Hispanic Studies, and of course, the English Department. And I want to thank Peter Trius, our patron saint, who makes this whole wonderful Trius thing possible. It's not so often that creative writers are the ones who go on to make oodles of money that they can then give back to their alma mater to endow a phenomenal writer's residency and corresponding reading series, but that's exactly what Peter Trius did with great generosity for and belief in a whole new generation of creative writers he would never get to meet. He imagined you all and set up this unique program with you in mind. Along these lines, please consider applying for next year's Trius Workshop with the fabulous New York Times best-selling novelist Jeff Vandermeer. No prerequisites for this class. You just have to write your way into it. I'll be sending out an email about this later, so look for it. No one's too young or too inexperienced or too not English major at uh, We've accepted students from all over campus for this class in the past, uh, and people from sophomores to seniors. So really think about doing this. It happens every fall semester. Uh, and we have a new writer. We try to choose writers who are very different from one another one year to the next so that you get to experience lots and lots of different people and perspectives. Uh, and you'll just send a writing sample and cross your fingers. Uh, so thank you, Peter Trius. And last but not least, I want to thank Mary Rufel, this year's Trius writer in residence. Mary is who I would vote to be if I got to vote to be someone when I grow up. She's funny and clever and serious and thoughtful and winking and charming and completely moving in her work and also just in life. And I count myself very lucky indeed to have been able to get to know her this year, to have her teach my students into wonderful new places and to get to call her my friend. Thank you, Mary, so much from all of us. Mary Beautiful. of silk, the mundane and archaic beloved by her. So what have we here? We have an artist who takes 
everything a woman ever did and turns it into an example of the world. She works with cloth, it's as simple as that. When she erases sonnets, she's pulling threads out of their surface. When she arranges envelopes, she's making pieces of a quilt. When she pulls punctuation out of a poem and presents it as a picture, she is isolating its embroidery. Her poems in themselves, those exhilarated fragments, are the purest form of the art itself. Everything has been evaporated from them, but the heartbeat, surrounded by silence. When she holds a button in her hands, she knows it is one of the earliest examples of nanotechnology, a tiny device that can guide and protect us. She makes connections between things that most of us would leave unconnected. Her work, all of it engages the eye, the hand, the ear, and the mind. She knows the unexpected wonder of pattern is everywhere, and that the smallest detail contains enough energy to spawn a universe. I think they should send her into space, if it were not for the fact her work has already sent us there. She understands the beauty of the symmetrical and the asymmetrical, the beauty of perfection and the beauty of the mistake, the miracle of needles that can stitch and scissors that can cut, the wonder of salvage, the edge that does not unravel, and the wonder of loose ends, the frayed and the flying. Her artistry is vast and inclusive by finesse and intelligence, by curiosity, wonder, forbearance, and vision, by painstaking attention to detail in the midst of an endless and abiding unknown. For this is where vision is born, in a circle of light in the darkness, by candlelight, where a woman is working, bent under its circle. By moonlight, where a woman is walking the edge of an ocean, planning, who knows, a society. By the light of the telescope and the microscope and screens. And always in the innate inner radiance of whatever takes our breath away. She makes me shiver. Mistress of the moon. I don't know how she does it, but she does, and I feel privileged to have been alive on Earth while she was doing it. Chinese poet Su Wei. 
and then I would go into the most detail about a project called the Silk Poems, from which I would like to read at the end. So some talking and then some reading. Thank you for this opportunity to share work with you. Can you hear me, even though I'm kind of still crying? <laughs> represent the complexity of how the poet Emily Dickinson frames her own work in poetry manuscripts and letters. The Dickinson composites are a series of six large-scale works I made by embroidering composite views of the marks from Dickinson's complex system of variants in her manuscripts. Dickinson's variant markings, the cross signs that precede certain words in her manuscripts, correspond to variant words or phrases preceded by a cross on the page. So that sounds simple enough if you think of it in, a, in relation, um, but then when you look at how it actually works, as with anything in Dickinson, <laughs> it gets wildly complex. So for example, the word souls might be marked as a variant, so it's preceded by the word cross, and in the line, in dying, tis as if our souls absconded suddenly, um, you suddenly have a variant for souls that's world, selves, or sun. And then when you read the next poem with any of those four words, you still hear the echo of that possible constellation, and it gets incredibly complex quickly. It's not that I think these marks are more important than other aspects of her work, what she wrote and how she wrote it, in the form she chose, should be at the very least seen and understood. The quilts were intended to point to the beauty, integrity, and cumulative magnitude of the variant system that Dickinson used. I wanted them to change how and what you see when you look at a manuscript by Dickinson. These quilts are made as a series of mends, as acts of restitution, and like books, they circulate. The series and the books that resulted from them have been traveling in international museum exhibitions for the last five years. A pang is more conspicuous in spring, in contrast with the, those things that sing, not birds entirely, but minds, minute effulgencies and winds. I'm just reading half, half of this one. This is unusual in the, in the book in that the writing fills the whole space. So the next ones you'll see it's divided quite differently. Uh, in my recent book, co-edited with Marta Warner, Emily Dickinson, The Gorgeous Nothings, I meant for the title to evoke Dickinson's own definition for nothing, the force that renovates the world and her definition for no, the wildest word we can sign to language. These gorgeous nothings are that kind of nothing. So I've been re reading King Lear, <laughs> which was at the Trias house, and it blew me away again seeing how nothing is used by Cordelia. Just like, oh, whoa. <laughs> it's, all, it's used as a stand-in for love, um, which makes great sense to me. In that context with Dickinson. Working closely with these manuscripts has taught me a lot about what I like to think of as Dickinson's construction of page architecture. It's particularly important to see her manuscripts because the line breaks you read in print editions do not correspond to her own. If you run a first line search for a Dickinson poem in edickinson.org, you can now compare the manuscript version with the print version. Um, I can go into the politics of why you don't see that later if you're interested, but I'm not going to by choice. <laughs> Dickinson composed approximately 3,000 extant manuscripts and sent roughly 300 poems out in letters. She used the envelope both as a container of and a surface for poetry. <coughs> Note how rough the handwriting is here. 
and how it is still assigned multi-directional arrangements, a turning sequence. The envelope writings in facsimile, accompanied by transcriptions here, allow readers to read and see Dickinson's material text in a new light. We made this book as an artist book for Granary Books first, and it gave us the total freedom to invent and establish our ideal space for reading these manuscripts. Much of it carried over into the trade edition with Christine Bergen and New Directions, things like the visual index, the decision to show the front and back of the manuscript, true scale, and the calibrated reading relationship between the manuscript and the transcription to privilege reading the manuscript. Sue Wei's reversible poem. <coughs> It was at the Silk Museum in Suzhou, China, realized, uh, researching for another project, the Silk Poems, that I first encountered a replica of a Chinese poem written in the fourth century by one of the earliest women poets, Su Wei. The poem is not only one of the earliest recorded poems by a woman, it is also one of the most complex poems in existence. Su Wei's poem is known in Chinese as Wan Ji Tu, or Picture of the Turning Sphere. It's composed as a 29 by 29 character grid, written and embroidered in silk. Su Wei was one of the first to use this form, a reversible poem called Hui Wen, that can be read in any direction, horizontally, vertically, diagonally, within the grid to yield something like 7,000 possible readings. Moreover, the poem was written in five colors in a diagrammatic screen, scheme based on celestial charts of the time. There are things you can only understand about the way the poem is structured by listening to the sound of it in Chinese. For example, the colored regions of the poem have a recognizable internal rhyme scheme. Poems in yellow are five syllables, poems in black, six syllables, poems in violet, four syllables, and so on. The color configuration has three different versions I've found. So I made a working version of each. Reading it in Chinese, even if one is fluent, proves extremely challenging. And for those of you who know Chinese already know that there's classical Chinese or uh, literary Chinese, and then there's simplified Chinese. This is in simplified, it's from Wikipedia, so it's the simplified version. Um, but there are something like 272 dialects, or 292 dialects of Chinese. So it's incredibly, I mean, when you just, when you reference speaking Chinese, it's already complicated. Um, a Chinese character can act as any part of speech, depending on context, and the meaning of the character changes according to the characters next to it. There are single characters within the grid that have up to 70 definitions with all meanings in flux, and that's just without the translation, or that's without filtering it through what they're being read next to. That's just, in and of themselves, 70. With all meanings in flux, as Su Wei wrote, one lingers endlessly in the poem, twisting and turning. Su Wei's poem had an explicit intended reader. She sent the poem as a letter to her husband, who had taken a concubine against her wishes and relocated far away for work. The poem, brought him back alone. Both brilliant and effective, the poem is known in China primarily through the narrative of this love story. The original is lost, and only written accounts and transcriptions remain. So I naturally became obsessed with the poem, finding ways to translate it to draw attention to Su Wei's work today. I'm not a Chinese translator, but I felt immense responsibility towards this remarkable poem and poet. So I began to work the back end of the quandary, trying to secure new translations of both the poem and the work written about it. David Hinton has translated one quadrant of Stargate, what he's, he translates that title as Stargate, into English for his FSG anthology on classical Chinese poets. But there's still no full translation of Su Wei's poem that has been published in English. The best scholarly book I found on Su Wei's poem was written by the French poet Michel Mattai, and there is some great news to report. The American poet and translator Jody Gladding, who we've had here recently, uh, translated, uh, actually, Hinton and Gladding, 
translated Matthias' book on Su Wei from French to English for New York Review of Books, Calligram series edited by Elliot Weinberger, and it's forthcoming either this year or next. So we just uh, gained considerably. When I get obsessed, I have a tendency to bring it into conversations with friends. And Karen Emmerich, a modern Greek translator at Princeton and one of my favorite specialists in complex translation quandaries, helped me find a way forward with Su Wei in my own work. Referring to the earlier works I did with Dickinson's marking system, she said what I needed to do is point in the most interesting way possible to draw attention to Su Wei's work rather than to translate it myself. So I began to think about how textile-based time, or slow time, in the poem allows a reader to have a unique and valuable experience of Su Wei's complex poem. If I embroidered it, it would be solely an act of craft, but if a person fluent in Chinese did, it would be many things. First and foremost, it would be a reading experience. If more than one person did it, it could become a conversation. This thought took me back to my prior visit to the Suzhou Embroidery Research Institute in the same town where I first learned about the poem, where a highly specialized double-sided silk embroidery technique worked on taut, translucent silk screens has been developed and perfected. The institute, founded in 1957, prides itself on employing over 100 professional embroidery masters and specialists in silk embroidery techniques. Their delicate and elaborate embroideries have been exhibited in more than 120 countries and regions, and have been appointed as official gifts presented to heads of foreign states many time over. On the other side of this embroidery is Prince Charles. You might recognize this lady died. Um, you know, research is a blur. It's a, it kills me that I don't have a photo on both sides, but maybe it's better that way. Um, Given my interest in the intersection of text and textile, layered authorship, poetic innovation, reading and reversals, and literary restitution, these two encounters in Sujo with Su Wei's poem and the Embroidery Institute resonated very deeply with me and found their way into a new project combining the two. Su Wei's reversal poem is currently in development and will begin in Sujo this fall. Three experts will spend a year embroidering and reading Su Wei's poem and its 7,000 possibilities. The project is focused on the embroiderer's journey reading and understanding this complex poem in textile time. The filmmaker, Charlotte Lagarde, and I will be living in Suzhou for significant portions of the coming year or years to initiate and document this process. Such a project needs many consultants, advisors, and partners. A publication with Christine Bergen is planned at the end, as is an installation with film and textile components inspired by highly interactive Chinese museum environments. Su Wei's reversible poem is already supported by expansion funding from Creative Capital and a Lucas Artist Program Fellowship at Montalvo. And please cross your fingers for me because it's a finalist for something I'll hear about tomorrow or something like that. <laughs> Uh, which would mean we get to start and go, so um, let's hope. All right, so poems. In late 2010, the journalist Amanda Schaefer wrote an article for Slate on new developments in silk technology and approached me about the possibility of expanding upon that work with her. We visited Tufts University Silk Engineering Lab to meet two researchers she had written about, David Kaplan and Fiorenzo Amanetto. Kaplan changed the fate of this 5,000-year-old material when he discovered how to liquefy silk. Since then, Kaplan and Amanetto have been reinventing silk as a cutting-edge biomedical and technological material, one that can be interfaced with optics, photonics, and microelectronics. 
and bioactive materials in the body. You're looking at Theo holding a nanopatterned silk film sensor mixed with hemoglobin. And I should say, I took this photo, or I actually shot some really awful video when I was touring the lab, and it, it was the best thing that I ever did because I was absorbing so much new information and exposed to so many things that when I went back to look at what I shot later, like, you know, a year later after I was pretty deep into research, there were things like, I didn't remember that he showed me this particular sensor. I thought it was something that he talked about. I forgot that I saw it. And there are just these layers of explanation of process that you can't possibly get in one go if you're hearing it for the first time. So it changed the way I started to work almost instantly. Um, to reel and use silk thread, cocoons are boiled in water. At Tufts, they go a step further to reverse engineer silk by liquefying it with water and lithium bromide. The filtering process, to clarify the silk solution, is akin to dialysis and results, so they're just removing it through salt, and results in liquid silk they can use to build back up into a variety of forms. But before I get any further, I want to show you a brief excerpt from Theo Amanetto's TED Talk on Silk, and I show it to you because my work is directly influenced by what he demonstrates. It's just a very quick clip. Make it seem almost too good to be true. It's sustainable. It's a sustainable material that is processed all in water at a room temperature. And it's biodegradable with a clock, so you can watch it dissolve instantaneously in a glass of water and have it stable for years. It's edible. Uh, it's implantable in the human body without causing any immune response. It actually uh, gets reintegrated in the body. It's technological, so we can do things like uh, microelectronics uh, and maybe photonics. And the material looks something like this. And in fact, this, this material you see is clear and transparent. This is, the components of this material are just water and protein. So this material is, is silk. I mentioned that the film is also technological, and so what does that mean? It means that, 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 that you, can, uh, you can interface it with some of the things that are typical of technology, like, uh, like microelectronics and, and nanoscale technology. And the image of the DVD here is just to, to illustrate a point that, uh, that silk uh, so follows very, very subtle topographies of the surface, which means that it can replicate features on the nanoscale, so it would be able to replicate the information that is on, that is on the DVD. And we can store information in this film of water and protein. So we tried something out, and we wrote a message in a piece of silk, which is right here, and the message is over there. And much like in the DVD, you can read it out optically. And this requires a stable hand, so this is why I decided to do it on stage in front of a thousand people. <laughs> and so, uh, so let me see. So if you see the, the film going transparently through there, then. the whole talk online. It's pretty wonderful. So if you have a health condition serious enough to monitor at all times, a silk sensor implanted just under your skin just might offer a less invasive way long term to visually monitor your health in the future. The nano pattern surface of the film allows this bioactive sensor to work as an optical device, one that can be monitored visually through the skin for changes. When I first encountered one of these silk films in Theo's office, I held it in my hand and projected the Tufts logo and random clip art onto the wall. And the content gap really surprised me. I mean, it seems menacing to live with a silk sensor inside you that you're monitoring for changes in appearance. And knowing what's written, inscribed, or layered there could be quite powerful, even transformative. It could create a vital imaginative space and that imaginative space is something that poetry and art are prepared to speak to in a meaningful, often profoundly moving way. Poems are sometimes considered frivolous, but I think they have jobs to do, too. When our lives get very difficult, they sustain us. They offer up a space to try to make sense of not just language, but being. The word text comes from the word textile, and I often work at the intersection of the two. When many people think of textiles, they think of clothes, but textiles can cross boundaries. My first weaving teacher designed 
weed structures for heart valves. A silk film inscribed nanoscale is a mind-blowing context to see language embedded in outside the body, and it's a tremendously meaningful context to imagine inside the body, especially since silk is universally biocompatible on surfaces as sensitive as the human brain. So just to be clear, every body, like literally every body on this earth will accept silk anywhere in the body. So that's, a, that's like medical gold. So that's what's, the liquid silk thing is a big deal for lots of reasons. Um, so I want to take this material, or the new form of this material, and the old form of this material, as subject and form in the silk poems, to explore the cultural, scientific, and linguistic complexities of silk textiles and the body in the form of a poem nano imprinted on silk film. To give you a sense of the scale of the inscribed writing, one nanometer is about three atoms in size. So I've been thinking about how poetic forms might be shaped by the structure of silk. At the DNA level, the building block of silk is a beta sheet. A beta sheet self-assembles just like a left thread in the weaving. Beta sheets are often compared to an ancient Greek method of writing called a bostrophodon, which means literally as the ox turns, because the line reverses as a plow turns in alternating directions. creating the silk filament of its cocoon enacts a very similar line. Sericulture history spans 5,000 years and interconnects radically different cultures, languages, and textile traditions all over the world. Some constants. Everywhere the cycle of the silkworm is the same. It feeds on mulberry leaves, goes through four periods of growth called instar. In each it eats, shits, sleeps, and pauses. Sleeps or pauses, some would say. A butterfly expert corrected me on my last time. She said, it's not really sleep, it's a pause. But in almost every language, it's literally sleep. So I can go with the language. And sheds its skin, a process called ecdysis. So it wakes up and it takes off its own skin. It's really wonderful. And in the fifth instar, it spins its cocoon. Um, I should say that the process behind that is that there are humans who are growing mulberry trees and feeding mulberry tree leaves to the silkworms. Um, at the beginning, chopping them very, very fine for the baby silkworms, and then as they grow older, they get the full branch and they're devouring the whole thing. Um, but it takes the tree, the person to bring the leaf to the silkworm, and what I learned in China is that the shit of the silver, which is basically like a mulberry pellet, is then fed to either fish or to sheep. And then the sheep shit, or the fish shit, is then fed back to the tree as fertilizer. And then the leaves go back to the silver. So it's a great process. This project has involved consulting over 30 international nanotech and biomedical labs, textile archives, medical libraries, and sericulture sites in North America, Europe, and the Middle East, and Asia. The Silk Homes receives support from Creative Capital, in the, uh, Creative Capital Grant in Literature, and the Bogliasco Foundation. The nano-imprinted silk poem will first premiere in a year-long exhibition at Max Mocha in May in 2016, and a publication featuring the poem is expected within that window. But where, I know not. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I took an experiential approach to research after Tufts and found immersion in all forms to be the right approach. My partner and filmmaker Charlotte Lagarde traveled with me to document silk research trips throughout the US, China, and Japan, France, Italy, Turkey, and Georgia since 2012 creating through photography, audio, and video a record of these research experiences to use as a part of the project. Because I quickly realized at Tufts that I didn't have the courage to film anything but anyone's feet. And it was a real problem in retaining information. Um, so it was really just a resource at first, and now uh, we're going to be working on a video together for the show 
to share some of those research experiences. So it turned it was kind of done in one spirit and then has turned to be something offered in another. So it's kind of great that way. Surprising. It changed how we work. So in China, the birthplace of Sarah culture and silk, we were able to see weaving demonstrations like this one in Hangzhou. And I, I saw this demonstration because I had reached a dead end in the library there. And finally, just grasping at straws, I said, so if Su Wei had woven her poem, how would she have done it? And they brought me to this loom. And see that red thread? So that red thread is one rotation in that whole sequence of knotted configuration. And what she's doing is she's untying, enacting, with the, she's untying each cluster, tying it up to the shed. The weaver below is throwing the shuttle the set number of times. She's retying it and moving it over one. And that's done for the whole thing. And that makes a piece of cloth about this big in the pattern repeat. So it's pretty easy to figure out. And if you've ever um, dressed a loom before, the amount of math that goes into doing that and the amount of threading and precision is bonkers, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so the, the, the probability of someone doing all of that for a very private poem is almost zero, in my opinion. So when I read, you know, when I read different accounts, it was a woven poem, it was an embroidered poem. I can say as a textile person, it's totally embroidered. <laughs> it's, it only makes sense that way. Um, so that was helpful to see, in particular. Um, uh, in contrast, in Suzhou, same town, uh, no, not the same town, but same town I saw the poem in first. At Suzhou University, we toured the silk engineering lab where they invented silk skin replacements for burn victims. At the State Silk Museum in Tbilisi, Georgia, we encountered a vast wonder cabinet and portal into silk production in the Caucasus, where cocoons were reared for much of Europe. So in this library, which is built for the silk station, there are books with images of the silk station within it. So you're looking, it's like, you're looking at a photo of the room you're sitting in and the museum you just toured that was made 100 years ago. It's a great experience. Um, so the museum was once a scientific station where Georgian silk was studied closely by male and female researchers. In Italy, where cultures from Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa often converged in trade, Artists and writers, or in this case, both in one, detailed silk productions in gorgeous hand-bound tribal diaries. In Como, I was surprised to see cocoons configured just like the substructure of Su Wei's poem, a complete coincidence, but the kind I really love. In textile archives at the Met, I sought out instances of silk inscribed with writing. This is the first place I went, so it was like, I was really inarticulate about what I was looking for. Um, I focused on the tiraz, a form popular from the 9th to the 12th century, made in weaving workshops in the Middle East and North Africa, especially Egypt. They were embroidered in silk with Arabic phrases to bless the wearer. And that's the loop you can look through. So that's the, you're looking at the actual s stitch of the embroidery there. It's chain stitch, and just as a side note, silk took over as an embroidery material in North Africa because it's superior to wool, which has very barbed fibers. So it's an instance of a material um, changing an entire culture's embroidery tradition because of its nature. I was strongly influenced by the rich tradition of Islamic textiles and manuscripts. In many cases, the use of images or icons is prohibited. And as a result, text and pattern text often take on architectural or structural proportions. So I was particularly interested in the way, both architecturally and on the page, uh, the letter and the scale of the letter is 
drastically different. So you see something that looks like scroll work, and it's actually tiny, tiny letters in that, in that area. And then you see the big letters. So you feel like you're, it's just, it's wild. In Paris, at the Institut du Monde Hub, I found an unexpected show quite relevant to a text inscribed inside the body, West African talismanic writings, many of which cite fragments of text from the Quran. Sometimes they're drawn or painted onto cloth and worn as talismanic shirts as an underlayer. And very much like the silk worm's cocoon, they're designed for protection. This one was tightly folded inside an amulet to be worn on the body. Earlier, I showed you silk at the DNA level, and silk beta sheets are also folded or furrowed like this manuscript. The varied trajectories of the silk road are represented differently in every place I went for research. This one cracks me up because it looks like the silk goes straight to Europe. And in the Chinese silk road maps, like, you don't even see Europe. <laughs> so um, it just became a, a little pleasure of mine. Um, I was often asked what I was searching for. It's a good question, um, very basic, but very difficult to answer. I could say, well, a poem, which you can't really say, or I'll know it when I see it, which isn't helpful, or the idiosyncratic and wonderfully strange things that will blow my mind, but instead I'll say, I'm, I'm looking for instances of inscribed silk textiles, anything related to poetry, the body, and then usually they're like, mm, yeah, and they set me free in the library. So I went up with a stack of books, like the books on that table, and then go solidly through them for two days. Um, so this works in some contexts and not in others, so I learned to adapt constantly. Nothing really worked the same way twice, and I learned not to fixate on getting certain things out of an experience, and learned to take a lot of different tacks until it worked. In Lyon, where the Jacquard Loom, our first binary computer system, was invented, and over 18,000 looms were once in production by a highly organized union of hand weavers, Louis Pasteur, the inventor of pasteurization, once solved the silk worms Cabrine epidemic. So that's the Jacquard in Lyon. So that, that's the way he did it. It's the Pasteur's experiment. In Yokohama, Japan, I was asked, do you have silkworms in the US? And I came to love displays like this one where I first fully and clearly understood what's going on inside the silkworm on a scientific level. These two triangular fibroid strands emerge from glands in the silkworm. In the glands, the fibroid is still in a liquid state. And as they emerge from the silkworm, they solidify and are coated with sericin, a gummy coating that holds the strands together. And I mentioned they're triangular, so that means they're prismatic. They split light into seven colors, which gives um, a lot of the, sh the shimmer and the optical qualities we see in silk. It's also what makes it a great silk foam sensor, as it turns out. They are woven by the silkworm into a cocoon in a figure eight configuration. It's our longest continuous natural fiber with the tensile strength of steel. I kept looking at this drawing as a guide, made by the silkworm, as a guide as I tried to find the right way forward with the poem. This is the poem I wrote, and it's based on the prior image. The poem has a six letter line derived from the six molecule repeat in the heavy fibrine chain of silk. We're going to fabricate the silk film at Tufts University later this month, and the inscribed image of the poem will look like a cross between this silk sensor, this irid and so the, the, the poem will be iridescent like that. It'll appear as an iridescent drawing, um, and that little cocoon. So we'll have the poem I wrote. Yeah, it's good So the first part of the poem is written from the perspective of the silkworm. It's addressed to a person with a silk sensor implanted inside them, and I'd like to read a little bit from it. Does that sound okay? Um, and afterwards, I'd be happy to take questions and discuss any of this further. Um, so, and I have some samples. I have a silk film here. 
for sure, if you want to see what they look like up close. And some cocoons, and then this is the silk filament that they then liquefy. So this is three states of silk. And you can hear the, the hard-working silk over there. Or is that actually the pupa by now? Is it okay if I take the screen away, if you have the image? So that's from a paper lantern slide, and it inspired a part of the poem. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I should say I'm going to skip over the part with a silver mother and a great sexy scene at the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to get the, to the depressing part about death. Um, so. <laughs> um, okay, so the silk poems. And I say I'm reading from part one, but I haven't finished writing part two, so I really don't. <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to do, but I haven't done it yet. But the first part, the whole poem, the poem is like, the first part of the poem is like 96 pages, and it gets to here. So the designer's like, yeah, I ran out of poems, so I just repeated it. <laughs> what do you mean this? It's so long already. How can you not take up that whole silver drawing? She's like, well, no, I just need it to the first. <laughs> so that second part is really necessary. Fun to have fun. <laughs> it is said that silk filature began in China under a mulberry tree in a teacup resting lightly in the slender hand of the Empress, Si Ling Shi. A brain unfurls from the frisson tangle and she reaches in, begins to reel filament from the soft envelope of the cocoon. That is how people like to tell it. You know the Nigerian proverb, until the lions have their own historians, history will always be told by the hunters? If you don't know it, why not? The poet C.D. Wright wrote, that it is a function of poetry to locate those zones inside us that would be free and declare them so. Are you surprised I quote a poet? Don't be. We invented language. Look, in divinations as early as the Shang Dynasty in 1050 BC, there are oracle script characters for silk, silkworm, silk fabrics, and mulberry trees. Silk, to say it in Chinese with the wrong tongue, is a death by stabbing, is the number four, is literally this. The radical in the character for silk precedes hundreds of words, words for paper, textile, for parts of a book, words for home, family, household, words like warp, weft, latitude, longitude, parallel, boundary, and root. Words like compile, compose, edit, arrange, weave, write, to make up, fabricate, invent, translate, paint, to group, plate, truss, organize, pass through, endure, display, to spin, shift, bear, stand, manage, maintain, after, through, past. The radical in the character for silk precedes imminent, ordinate, abiding, ruby, red, a net, a line, a wire, a thread, a string, a filament, the smallest, slightest, hardly, a bit, a deformation, shaped like a line. You know the book, the I Ching? Look at the 57 hexagrams. Look at the eight trigrams. 
Our leaves, strewn in layers, whole or eaten through, when punctured taste of light. I said that through one. The word chain signifies the warp threads of a textile. It means what is regular, a reference. The jagged radical for silk precedes it. See the word for a hexagram, yao, and you'll see mulberry too, same. That's visual. Right, and then the silkworm goes on to read the different numbers from the I Ching, which are all about molting, shedding, <laughs> eating, transforming. Um, but I'll spare you that part. Furthermore, have you never asked why Book One of the Confucian Analects is called Digested Conversations? <laughs> really? From the philosopher born in a cave called the Hollow Mulberry Tree? I'll recite my favorite passage for you. When I have presented one corner of a subject to anyone, and he cannot learn from it the other three, I do not repeat my lesson. In my fourth instar, I learn our true skin is transformation, our medium and material. They say I have a short life, but I have an even shorter death. I have so many, it pains me. Imagine this for 5,000 years. Death comes, or it comes three weeks later. It's the coming back that's hard. Memento mori, Morris Alba, the mulberry, Bombix mori, me. You think I am morbid, I am. Imagine the language written in me. Mulberry, mulberry, mulberry. I finish slowly, start from the back. The fine hairs are a shiver. Nothing left but the vein. I throw my head back and laugh. In laughing, sleep. Hard. Nearly 30 hours. Difficult to extricate myself this time. This skin, who can get me out of it? Okay, okay, I'm awake. Six simple eyes to make out light, 28 chromosomes, 14,623 predicted genes, 4,000 muscles, not to brag, my retractable head, my robust thorax and abdomen, each segment, each set of legs, my pro legs, my true legs, my claspers in the rear, are all true to me. I'm oleophagous, mulberry monogamous, leaf polyamorous, I'm insatiable voracious, I love them cooled in the shade. Mulberry leaves, no two alike. They clear heat, metabolize sugar, and expel wind. I choose sideways, eat thousands of arcs, in dizzying detail, enough to write the greatest book on Mobera culture. <laughs> Did I mention my horn? What it's for? Pleasure. Sarah culture is a culture of love, I say, in it. Of living and dying, of interdependence and honorable relationships of tending and expertise, of rare compatibility. Adrienne Rich writes, love is a process, delicate, violent, often terrifying, a process of refining. I know she meant us. Our name means treasure. Inside me, spiracles, concentric branches, a weft too beautiful to see. Nabokov writes, you read with your spine. I read with my breathing. A transparent chain of tubes, nine pairs, they flower on each side of my body. With each contraction, they circulate delicious oxygen in movement, freshness. It was good to be a larva, and it was good to be an egg. With hundreds of siblings and plenty to eat, I am fully fledged, fat as a finger, pale slate blue, oyster white, 10,000 times heavier, 30 times longer, and to the 
about 30 days old. But who is counting? Me. So carbs love to count. <laughs> Two, four, six, eight. I will show you myself. A safe place to transform. I slip in to do the work. Restless, fidgety. I regret my bravado. I shrink a little, pinkish, and my chest becomes transparent. I throw my head back, and I feel like I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Silk comes sputtering out of my spinneret, just below my mouth. Nine or ten inches of it in the first minute. Sixty-five elliptical motions. My head is spinning. The brain issues in a glutinous state hardens into lines, becomes structure. First I panic, then I relax into it. I enter the flow. With strength, length, and luster, the fibroid strands emerge prismatic. Two triangular tubes glued by Saracen in the spinneret. When light shines through a prism, it breaks into seven colors. With the elasticity, affinity, and the right mindset, all ways are easy. I write it side to side in infinity loops, figure eight spins, 15,000 times, 300,000 times, 400,000 times, as much as six miles, 60 hours, three days. Sure, I count. I slow it down, concentrate it on the line, elongate the loop, modulate it, trying to think of the words I want to spend time with. Beta sheet, postrephidon, weaving a weft thread. To reverse the reverse becomes the work. An epitaph carved in alternating directions, from right to left and left to right, an elegiac couplet mourning a good son. Oi, 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 the grief inscribed in every letter. Io, 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 the letters inscribed in every letter. The zeros and the ones, the punch cards of the jacquard loom, our first binary computer. It's so hard to let go of contextualization, to separate your right brain from your left and build back up, to remove specific outcomes and truly create something new. Silk, language, a medium infinitely larger than any intention. Once I start reading, I can't hear. A practice is not a thing in itself. It is a way to be happy and calm in life. The work is your teacher. Hard work is your teacher. We are singing the techniques that will last. This little silk in me, polymath, string figure, present, small wild things that shine obstinately. Transformation is my medium, filament my record how it holds the boundary of my body firm, free from harm. Here I is, cloth tissue, body tissue. Here is this thing I made of myself with others alive in you. I give you my fey eye, my flying garment for the soul. I've drawn infinity into it.
Yeah, and I thought about that a lot. I mean, because there are, there are wild silk farms too that do still live in the forest, but they're like, they're considered sacred forests, so they're also protected. Um, and you find more wild silk farm species, you find all four wild silk farm species in India in particular. Um, in, in India, and there's, I think my favorite wild silk farm instance is in Madagascar, where um, there's a very special cloth woven to, to exhume and rebury the dead. And sometimes um, ancestors are clustered together in the same shroud, but the shroud is blessed and danced upon and touches everyone in the community before it is uh, um, reused as a shroud. So that's kind of, that's the most amazing And it's woven from the wild silk, yeah. I thought they couldn't eat without being fed. The Bombix Mori can't. So they're totally interdependent with humans. And I would say humans are totally interdependent with them. So I started, you know, I started to think a lot about these things like they can't eat unless we feed them and we're killing them at the end. And it actually seemed like a pretty good relationship for everybody, you know, like the silkworm domesticated us not the reverse. I mean, we, they, they wake up and we're feeding them, you know? It's like, it's not such a bad thing and that they're biocompatible in our bodies. I think it, it's like, it reflects a harmony in my mind. And that's not to um, ignore serious labor concerns or health concerns for silk reelers or um, the fact that you're killing the silkworm. But if you kill the silkworm, or if you don't kill a silkworm, the difference is 21 days. So it's not like the silkworm goes on to a long, happy life. The silkworm goes on to three more weeks in which it might get to have sex and then flutter around some more, which you know, is worth considering. But some of, a, lot of them, a lot of them do. You know, they're bre- you know, silkworm selected for breeding, and then they get to do their thing. So yeah, this, they're totally dependent, and as are we. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, if the silkworms, uh, the eggs hatched on a mulberry tree, mm-hmm. they could eat mulberry. They would eat, right? Hypothetically, but, like... I mean, I mean it's very, it's, it's common among the insect species, like the monarch butterfly. Right. They just eat milkweed or, or plants that have the same chemical composition. So, uh, you know, the, the species would... I mean, I, I think this is a pr- production idea that it's easier to do it that way than to be clambering around the mulberry tree trying to find your silkworms. You don't have to do that. Right. So we right. I mean, they chop the leaves out and they put them, but they couldn't eat the leaves. I mean, uh, their 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 mouth parts have changed in a very revolutionary way. You, you could speak. I I recommend trying it. And then you have a mulberry tree and you can hatch them at the exact right well, time. Right. Yeah. But the wild ones do this. I mean, this is just. It, this is just a way of manufacturing right. of, of manufacturing silk that right. we hatch the eggs and take care of the whole process. It right. doesn't mean that they wouldn't be able to do this if they had They actually to. can though. Yeah, I read that in Japan yeah. you would do it, there would be So the wild silkworms can, but the the domesticated silkworm, the Bombex mori, um, the 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 ants, when they're first born, they're called ants instead of silkworms. Um, are an eighth of an inch long, and they can't find their way into the leaf unless it's extremely tender or it's cut fine for them. So I didn't read that part, but the silkworm turns its head and then hits the mulberry leaf. And they really do eat, they eat, when they're first born, they eat the, that edge of the leaf, the cut edge. So they're going into the softest part they can get, and then it's gradually increased. But they also can't fly anymore. So the moth can't move moth away from the tree. Yeah, but the moth lays 300 to 500 eggs. So if some moth moths, yeah, that would support one. One tree won't support that much eating. One tree will support, I think, something like 12 cell worms. It's crazy how much they eat. They really like mm-hmm. what they metabolize in their 30-day lifetime is. Almost obscene. And, and we do have silkworms. Yeah. In America, but, yeah. Of, but, the, but the problem is that the thread is not uh, unravelable. 
apparently. And they, they tried to do that in the Sokopia Luna laws, polyphemus, all these kinds of that. But they've never been able to have a silk industry because they couldn't extract the thread. It didn't, it didn't unravel in the way in which Mothers Mori was one long unraveling thread. There are a lot of mulberry trees planted in the belief that silk could take off here. Well, and but these, these, these things don't eat mulberry. They eat elm and other kinds of trees. So they don't have their own you know, food source. There was a, there was a, um, there was a great effort made in the colonies to raise silk. And Martha Washington's wedding dress was made from Virginia silk. And so there was this kind of, you know, Something you could compare to silk in England, um, coronation dresses being made of local silk, raised by local, you know, silkworms and so on. But I kind of, I mean, I love, I love being an American thinking about silk because we're like, we're nothing. <laughs> it's, and so every time you know, like William Stalin writes, like silkworms must be fed, fed leaves of their own age, age, and the silkworm in my poem is like, yeah. 3,376 years after we were already doing it in China. <laughs> so, the, you know, the, the cultural context always comes in. And Americans are, you know, we're good consumers of silk, but we don't, we don't contribute that much to it. Um, yeah. um, do you have any plans to implant a silk phone into a person? Well, Mary said she'd offer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, you're talking about the kind of like cyclicality. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just, the moment I trained this book on it, I thought, oh, you know, maybe there's some sort of secret agenda. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course there is. Um, you know, after I started on this project, I was always, you know, talking about the skin and pointing to the skin, and I got skin cancer, like, within that range, and so I have a, a piece of my nose that's from behind my ear, so I should have synesthesia by now, but it was so interesting, <laughs> it was so interesting to think about, um, you know, silk in relation to skin, I'm just thinking, like, why isn't there a silk skin, why isn't there a silk sensor for skin cancer, for example, which is, you know, so kind of barbaric if you have any problems with your skin, you have to have it physically removed with a scalpel and tested, which is like crazy in our day and age. So um, I think that, and there are silk skin replacements already, but they're not widely used yet. Um, I don't know. I mean, I had the sense like maybe I would think it easy, you know. Or maybe someone would, but you know, in terms of real science and FDA approval, like silk is being, uh, vaccines are being stored in silk because they can be stored room temperature, and that's a big deal for vaccines in the international picture. We also know a little bit about vaccine um, debates. They're stored in mercury, which is really toxic um, to the recipient, so it's a, it could be a huge thing for, say, autism or um, other, other things that have been tied to mercury and vaccines. So, so that is already in the works, but it's seven years out from FDA approval. So these things, once they're pioneered, they take time to make it through the pipeline. So, yeah. I think you were first. <laughs> Thank you so much for your, your reading and for sharing that story. Nice. It, the level of devotion and attention and study and care that has gone into um, transforming it into an artwork is really interesting to me. I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit about um, how it's transformed you in the process. Like, how are you different now than before you embarked? Sorry. That's a really good question. Well, I'm trying to think of what I can attribute to this project and process and what I can contribute attribute to other things in my life. 
um, and they're all of a piece, so it's funny to separate them out. But um, but I do feel like the way this inquiry um, led me through the world um, changed the way that I wanted to make work thereafter. So something like the Su Wei poems, um, or the Su Wei reversible poem, like I wouldn't have. I might have come across that, but I would have never approached it in the same way as I hope to now. And I don't think I would have had the um, the wherewithal to do all the other aspects of what are required to do a project like that. And so it takes a lot, you know, learning Chinese and working with a lot of translators and then working with cultural experts who can help you um, you know, do it in a sensitive, interesting way. And um, one thing that's really hard about choosing that path is that you're always bumping up into your own ignorance and your own flaws and um, your own threshold for <laughs> travel or <laughs> um, discomfort. Uh, not physical discomfort, but like emotional. <laughs> I, I'm a very shy person, so it's hard to go into the all the time um, and be asking something. You know? So, yeah, it's, um, it's emboldened me. I don't think it's made my life easier, but it's made it way better. <laughs> so. um, I was wondering at what stage in your research process you conceived of your final product. Um, uh, and because you, you mentioned how long it was, mm -hmm. uh, were you ready as you went, kind of supplementing it with new information as you got it, or did you let, did you take everything in and then let it congeal and then start? Um, so the the I felt like I knew nothing through the whole process. I was just like, please let it be. Please let it work out. You know? Like just kind of thinking, like, what question haven't I asked? Where have I gone? What have who else can I talk to? You know, just kind of, it was just the most of the process was for, was involved with following threads of curiosity, you know, about really following questions and following resources offered to me through channels um, as I went. And um, I took a ton of notes. I mean, my notebook stack for this project is crazy, and it's very hard to go back into a stack of notebooks like that to try to write one poem. Um, just time-wise, it's like it's painful to go four years deep into something. Um, <laughs> you can really, uh, and um, and I still didn't know how it was going to be a poem until like the end of last year. And so when I went to Montalvo, they invited me to come for the Suwe project, and I was like, yes, but I really need to write the sub poem. Might I just do a little hiking research on the Suwe project while I'm there with the extensive network of Chinese speaking hikers that you have and write a poem. So it's like kind of a, <laughs> I'll be working on Suwe later kind of instance. But it was during that time that I did a full sweep of all of my notes and a full sweep. I couldn't even do, I mean, I have a crazy amount of images and video footage and it's been a real relief to collaborate with Charlotte on the video because it's too much. All of it is just way really too much. And um, and coming to the the sixth letter realization came at Montalvo, just really trying to figure out how how to get the science in it in a way that was um, structural but not um, didactic. You know, and and so I really had no idea that that line, which I've been thinking about as a kind of bootstrap like a line like we think of lines might be a line that contained a smaller strand. And I think that comes from Islamic textiles, of seeing something even smaller in the shape of what you think is the thing. So um, I'm really happy that thing that I loved came back into the poem. And then, you know, I then you find yourself in this position of saying, like, hey, do you guys know any designers could make a six-letter sausage? <laughs> I have the drawing of what I want it to look like, and I have the poem. Like, anyone up for that? <laughs> and uh, and then you have you know a new family of friends and collaborators. So um, it's 
it's been interesting. And then it'll be fun going back to the lab at Tufts to see what the material does and how we get to fabricate it. And then, you know, so right now I'm at the fun part where I'm just like making a long list of things, you know, writing to everyone who's helped me saying, like, how would you like to be listed in the credits? And how, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and I should say the other thing about the poem is that my friend Liz Willis very generously has an apartment in Queens that she's not using most of the time. <laughs> uh, she's teaching in Iowa City. And um, she let me do a little residency there. And that was perfect because it's a small apartment. It's a cocoon. You know, like, you just like, nobody's bothering you. So I'm in the town, roughly, that I live in. but four days there, and it's like, you know, and it's four days that I've been carrying up for, too, so there's that momentum you go in with, but I got the most done there that I've gotten done anywhere I've been. So there's a certain amount you could say is just being ready, and a certain amount you could say is having a deadline, <laughs> uh, because the work has to be done by early May, and, um, but yeah, the second part of the poem is really hard because I wanted to bring in, I mean, there's a lot in the international um, research that I wanted to bring back in about how silk moves through cultures and through discourses. And um, I still don't know how, I mean, I think it's the cloth that's going to narrate that part, but it doesn't have, like, I, I can't hear it yet. Whereas a silver was like, hey, <laughs> I got another joke for you. <laughs> I love that so far. All right, so thank you. Well, I have a question. If the, if the, by the time that the show opens, if that's called me, if the uh, poem on the, on the, Film on a soap film mm -hmm. is not ready, mm -hmm. right or done, to mm -hmm. be projected mm -hmm. large. Do you have any plans for like a, a, a blown up embroidery of the poem that wraps around? I mean, there's going to be a large scale, or you're really, okay. that's a, that's yeah. a great question. So there will definitely be a silk film that mass smoke. It might not be the final form of the poem. But it'll be the poem. So, um, so I will definitely make the sensor for the show, and it'll be accompanied by a very tiny screen video. So that will, that's the show. But at the end of the year, I go to the Rauschenberg residency in Florida, and they have like fabrication facilities to die for, and great studio assistants who work for Rauschenberg. And I know from another artist who's been there that they can print large-scale silk cloth with digital printers. Um, and I wanted to do a large-scale version of the poem where you can actually read the letter as a banner. Because a silk banner is something that comes up a lot in the history of silk, especially the movement of silk. And so. Might be doing those and then photographs of the moon 